Hey everybody, it's Michael Fisher with Pocket Now. And this is Anton Dinay. And we are here on the last day of coverage at MWC 2013 in Barcelona. We thought we'd take you for a quick tour of everything we liked. And everything we did not like. Out on the show floor. So, let's check it out. Let's do it. When it comes to devices, this year's MWC wasn't as big a disappointment as CES. There was a bounty of smartphones and tablets for us to feast our eyes and hands on. However, when you compare this year's MWC to last year's, you cannot overlook the sliding trend of trade shows in general, especially with HTC now joining Samsung and moving away from the Barcelona show for its big product unveilings. We're set to see this happen, but it's just a normal evolution of brands. On to the hands-ons. We were big fans of the devices Sony brought to the table back at CES, and that held true at this year's MWC, with the beautiful, slim, light, and waterproof Xperia Tablet Z. Handling this Android tablet was truly amazing, especially for someone like me, who doesn't get much quality time with Sony hardware, and it made me excited for the future of the Xperia line for the first time in ever, really. The line between phones and tablets keeps getting thinner and thinner. LG brought the Optimus G Pro phablet to try and offer a decent alternative to the Note 2, and they have succeeded up to a point. That said, Samsung will probably bring the Note 3 at this year's IFA, so these competitors have no time to rest on their laurels. Until then, the G Pro is, at least in our book, something to consider. And the Optimus G Pro wasn't the only phablet we got hands-on time with. ZTE was on hand with its smartphone tablet offering, the Grand Memo. But that Me Too device didn't capture nearly as much attention as the ASUS phone pad, essentially a modernized Nexus 7 with a metal back, Intel inside, and yes, an earpiece, so you can use it like a phone, if you want. It's not something I'd ever use, but I know my esteemed co-host definitely has different feelings on the matter. Yes, I do. Real earpiece phone functionality was something I wanted on smaller tablets for a long time, as an alternative to Bluetooth accessories and speakerphone. The phone pad brings that, and so does the Samsung Galaxy Note 8.0. The South Korean device also brings another heavyweight to the table, the S Pen, this time with added functionality for air view and capacitive buttons. Another notable tablet, though not for its good points, was the HP Slate 7, a low-cost Android device with an odd screen resolution and unremarkable specs. About the most exciting thing about this device was its Beats audio integration and its baked-in print functionality, which should tell you all you need to know about HP's current position in the tablet market. Amazing how much can change in two years. Fortunately, there were more interesting things to see in the uncommon form factor territory. ASUS has brought the third iteration of its unique phone and tablet offering with the Pad Phone Infinity. There's no middle road here, you either love the concept or stay away from it. And of course, even if you are in the first category, you'll have to squeeze that wallet because $1300 is something you could easily spend on two different devices. We were quite disappointed, though not necessarily surprised, to find that Nokia didn't have a true PureView Windows Phone device waiting in the wings at MWC. Once we got over the letdown, we found the Lumia 520 and 720, devices that aren't going to satiate those hungry for a spec-heavy meal, but with them, Nokia and Microsoft are driving the Lumia line's price down, and driving higher-end features like great camera performance lower in the lineup. That's a winning story for everyone rooting for Windows Phone, even if it's not the most bombastic news we ever heard. The big guys weren't the only ones playing the field. We got to see one of the most promising new offerings from the startup sector at MWC, Yola Sailfish OS. We got a tour of the OS and we would lie if we said we were not impressed. The entire concept, both visually and functionally, is different than all the new offerings out there. There's still a long way to go, but if you come to think of it, that third spot in the ecosystem war is only a couple of percentage points away. And something else caught our eye while we were in the far reaches of the trade floor. Yotaphone didn't just have a fancy booth, it had a fancy phone. The self-titled smartphone is all business up front with Android Jelly Bean, but it's a full-on party in the back with identically sized e-ink display protected by Gorilla Glass. You can throw text, images, maps, notifications, whatever you want on the back and use that screen when it's appropriate. It's not for everyone, but it's this kind of innovation we were hungry for in a show dominated by iterative improvements, and we're excited to see where it goes. All in all, MWC was fun, as usual but left us with that slight bitter taste that it too has started its downfall. 
Of course, the new venue accommodates more companies and visitors, but with the key players slowly moving away for more buzz and exposure, we can't help but wonder what will happen next year and who will be joining the list of the missing along with Samsung, HTC and Google. Although MWC appears to be undergoing the same transformation as CES and the rest of the trade shows, the optimistic part of us tends to think it's okay because the gaps are being filled by smaller, younger companies showing products that are almost as, if not more, interesting than those of the big guys. We're excited to cover MWC again next year. So that's it about the MWC 2013. Be sure and stay tuned for our next major event, which is March 14th with the Samsung Galaxy S4 launch. And then of course the August or September IFA in Berlin. And another CES after that. It never really stops, does it? So this was Anton Dinaj. This was Michael Fisher. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure on my end as well, sir. And we will see you next time. Bye.